This is Duke University. I bring greetings from the General Assembly. That's why I'm gussied up this way. I usually detest the monkey suit, but sometimes you got to wear it. So the great leaders down there trying to figure out what's going on with coal ash and many other things. All right, great. We are up and running. So with that said, yeah. Yeah. so if I'm going to talk about water, we first have to talk about the fact that water is not a very uh, easy subject to talk about. I think Mark Twain had the best quote out there. It's that if you're, if you're a water person, you really like your whiskey, but whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And this seems to be true no matter whether you're talking about water quantity or water quality. It seems to be true across the board, any place you go. As I said, even with the coal ash situation we're looking at, there's still all sorts of problems with that. So most people think that this is what a river should look like. They like it to be beautiful. They want it to have you know, some nice trees, some dappled sun, some nice recreation on it. And that's really great. Unfortunately, our rivers can look like this. This is what happens when we haven't done very good water management with our, in, our, in our lands and in our, in, in our cities. We end up getting situations like this. There's tons, there's millions of dollars worth of, actually billions of dollars worth of damage due to poorly managed water in our communities. So this brings us to where is the water quality management in our landscape? So if you look at a picture like this, you can see, you know, it's a, this is downtown Durham. You're looking at some cars, you're looking at some curb. The only thing that's in here that actually manages for water quality are the trees. Our entire landscape has been designed solely to get water off of our roads and our streets and our yards and away from our houses as quickly as possible. And we've looked at using our streams and rivers essentially as uh, waste pits. Now, it takes a lot to get this to actually become water quality management. Why is it a problem? So originally when cities like Durham and all of our cities across the country were formed, it was not an issue at all because there just wasn't enough developed land there for it to create a problem. But as you increase the amount of developed land, you increase the problem. So people often look at from a policy perspective like, why is this all coming up now? Well, it's because we've grown to a certain extent that this is now becoming a problem. And so in North Carolina, how big of a problem is this really becoming? So this is North Carolina in 1960. This is North Carolina in 1980. This is North Carolina in 1990. And this is projected for 2030. It's not going to get any better anytime soon. And this is why we're seeing it right now. Because we're seeing the, all of this development has created these huge problems as far as stormwater runoff. And no one has any idea how to actually resolve it. Well, it's not that no one has any idea. But the ideas are totally foreign to the people who are asked to deal with it. So what does it mean? So with more infrastructure, more um, urbanization, less sort of uh, areas where that rainwater can soak in, you're going to get more floods. It's going to happen more often. Not only are they going to happen more often, the high level is going to last longer. So you're going to end up having all, of these, all this water sitting around for a lot longer period of time. And after the flood is gone, your rivers are going to have even less water in them. So you're going to have a water quality problem, not just a water quantity problem. So how do we resolve this? Well, the answer is this nice little chart here. So where we are right now is the yellow line. We are, I think this is my laser pointer. Meh. So the yellow line is what we're looking at with an urbanized landscape. And in that situation, you're seeing these huge, these huge runoffs and these really low base flows. What we want to get to is the green line. That's your natural hydrology. If you can get back to that, you can let your river actually do the things that it's designed to do. And rivers, remarkably, after billions of years, are in fact designed to do different things. But we are in no way able to get to that right now. So this is what I would consider traditional infrastructure. This is super traditional infrastructure. This is from um, a, friend of, a colleague of mine on his um, honeymoon went to Greece and took this photo. This is a stormwater drain from about 480 BCE. Looks a lot like the stormwater drains we have in our communities today. So technology just hasn't moved forward very much in the most uh, used ways. But this is what our infrastructure should look like. You're seeing a lot more integration. You're seeing trees, plants. You're seeing connection between your road and the natural world. So you have more modern infrastructure. So if we shifted from those sort of traditional infrastructure styles to this more modern style, we'll get back to that green line 
and see a lot, and see, give the rivers the, actual, the opportunity to manage themselves. But of course, the challenge is, we've built all of these communities already. So we have already done all of the damage which we can possibly do, and now we are looking, at, and, and we can't move all of us out, rebuild, and come back. First, that's just a total logistical nightmare. B, there's just not enough money. And C, I wouldn't even want as an advocate to suggest that. So how do we do it while we're all living here and going about this? Well, it's a slow process. Um, and I think about it as using green infrastructure. So the purpose of green infrastructure is you take your stormwater, you collect it in, in a place. It can be small or big. Some people think big wetlands are green infrastructure. I like to like small bioretention, rain gardens, things of that nature. So if you do that, that has the opportunity to let the water uh, infiltrate into the ground. The ground has the ability to treat and then slowly release that into our streams. This has a water quality benefit. It also has a water quantity benefit. So what are we talking about with green infrastructure? Simple things. This is a curb cut. You can put this in on any road. It's bioretention. Water flows into that. It settles in. The plants end up doing a lot of the uh, treatment there. And it gets into the water table. It can be used pretty much anywhere. Not a huge cost in order to get it into the roads. You can do these types of things. These are, these are uh, additional filter boxes, filtration boxes, where you put in a tree, and your stormwater flows through that. Does a lot of the same thing. I've got one of my favorites, which is permeable pavers. You put these out. You can spray a lot of water on them. You can have a lot of infiltration. It ends up detaining it. Some of it's evaporated. Some of it's infiltrated into the ground. You can also do green roofs. This is a great thing for a lot of sustainability issues. Not only are you treating stormwater, but you're also helping deal with the heat island effect, as well as uh, some habitat issues for migratory birds, butterflies, all sorts of great bugs. Some, we even see like rodents, not, not like your rats and your mice, but actual rodents that you like, um, and end up making habitat out of some of the roofs that are out there. But you've got to make this all make sense. As I said, there's a big cost to it. But oftentimes, when you're doing the planning, people talk about the cost, but people don't necessarily like to talk about the benefits that you're going to see. This comes from a process called the triple bottom line analysis, where you're looking at, first, the environmental uh, issues, which I've been talking about. And so a lot of us who are environmental advocates, we look at, hey, we need to do better water quality. We need more water quantity. And that's where we come at it from. However, if you're the city, a municipality, a business owner, you're going to ask, well, what's in it for me? How much is this going to cost me? What are my returns on that investment? Well, a lot of times you can't get that return on the investment until you bring the social side into it. So this is, what are we going to do to reduce heat stroke? What are we going to do to reduce heart attacks? How can we deal with obesity in this country? Those are the questions that come up here. And what we should look for when we're doing this is that nice spot, because this is a great Venn diagram, in the middle where the environmental benefits, the economic benefits, and the social benefits overlap. And when you've hit that, that's how you're actually going to be able to resolve a lot of these water quality problems. And we're seeing communities all over the country take the triple bottom line approach and be able to resolve some of our water quality and quantity issues. So I'm going to end with this slide of Philadelphia. So Philadelphia has this problem. They are under consent decree from the EPA in order to reduce their uh, wastewater that's going into the rivers around them. They have something called a combined sewer overflow system, which means your stormwater and your wastewater is flowing through one pipe. Too much water gets in there, it dumps raw sewage into the rivers. This is a completely permitted thing within this country, but we don't like it, so we're trying to figure out a way to resolve it. So Philadelphia, what they said is, they said, look, we're going to put, we're going to invest billions of dollars, because the option was billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars, and they chose the billions of dollars option, and we're going to make Philadelphia look like this. And they found that not only is this going to totally change the way Philadelphia works, but it'll help, it'll increase the property values within the city, it will increase health benefits, and it'll resolve their stormwater problem. And I think with that, I'm done. So thank you very much.